here with you all this morning. I apologize for those who are visiting from out of town. Uh, many from my church, from our church in, in Georgia, you have to listen to me. You came all the way to Arizona <laughs> and to hear me preach. So, uh, I'm here, Pastor Anderson. I'm sorry for that. It's not this week. But I really enjoy being here. It's great to see everyone uh, this morning. My mic apparently is not on. So I will. It's muted. There we go. That's a little bit better. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Excellent. So I appreciate being here with you all this morning, and uh, hopefully the sermon will edify you a little bit this morning and encourage and maybe even warn a little bit. And what we're going to do is we started off here in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Uh, great story. It's a really exciting story. I'm going to focus more on the beginning of the chapter here where Jonathan and his armor bearer go unto the Philistine army. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover a few stories from Scripture, and we're going to look at some uh, great wisdom on how small actions or just certain events, just just one decision making can turn into, you know, huge ramifications, right? So sometimes decisions that we make or things that we do, the, the results of things can turn out way bigger than you might ever even expect. Now, what we're seeing here with Jonathan, this, this could be kind of a big decision, right? This is a weighty decision for him to decide to go and just start fighting against an army. But what we're going to see from Scripture, too, it's, it's not just big decisions in life. Sometimes it's even very small decisions that can end up having huge consequences and it's in both the positive and the negative, right? The things that we do, they're like seeds that are sown that will come back and, and bring the fruit of whatever it is that we're doing. But let's start with some of the exciting things because I think we all here would agree we'd love to see these great works be done. And it's always exciting to hear these stories and we can apply them spiritually for ourselves in the fight of the faith that we have to live every day. And we have these battles that we have to face. And we need more people that can be like a Jonathan here. If you look down there in verse number six, the Bible says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over under the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And in all that we do, we need to maintain this faith in knowing in all of our decision making, hey, look, ultimately God will work, right? The, the, we know that God is going to work together for good for those that love him, to those that are called according to his purpose. And we ought to be making the decisions and making the, 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 the decision of our life on what we're going to do and how we're going to move forward with the full confidence knowing that the power of God is with you and is going to be behind you when you're doing his will. And what we have here is a story of this Philistines. And, and you know, the Philistines, it's a heathen army, but it's a people who defy the Lord. It's people who are direct opposition to the Lord and are fighting against everything that the Lord would stand for and that the people of God are standing for. They are oppressors. They are uh, the enemies here of God. And Jonathan is someone who, is, who sees the need. He sees the battle. They're kind of at this standoff where they're both on you know, even ground, as it were, and for either uh, army to advance, they're going to have to take uh, 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 an inferior position in order to move forward. And Jonathan is basically gets his point with saying, well, hey, why are we just standing around here? Let's go and fight because God is on our side. We could move forward. And hey, God doesn't need a whole army to fight. He could win by many or by few. So in that full faith, he says to his armor bearer, hey, why don't we just go up to him? His armor bearer, like, sure, I'm with you, Jonathan. And of course, um, you know, in the story here, it says, okay, well, if they say, to, we're, you know, we're going to make ourselves known. If they say, well, come on up here, then we know that God's with us. We're going to go up and fight. And if they say, you know, basically just wait, then we won't go up and do it. And of course, they end up going up. They say, yeah, come on up to us. We'll show you a thing or two. And they end up killing, I think it was about 15 or 20 men at the very beginning in a short uh, space of ground. And that freaks out the whole army to where they all end up fleeing. If you jump down there to verse number 16, we see the result. The Bible says, in the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked and behold, the multitude 
melted away. So they have watchmen that are looking at, out at the armies, the opposing armies, and he sees they're all start melting away. It says, and they went on beating down one another. So they got all freaked out just over two men. Jonathan and his armor bearer go up. They start, uh, you know, killing some people. And there's all this confusion and turmoil to where they start fighting each other and just melting away. And that was the result of one person. And as we continue through this chapter, then we see this is like this great impetus to move forward and then continue that, that momentum gets rolled in that direction of Israel to where they continue to fight and win battle after battle after battle. And if we flip over to chapter 17, of course, a very famous passage, we see the same spirit in David of one that is willing to face whatever the opposition is and has one decision that he makes, which again has great ramifications. That one decision of Jonathan to just say, hey, we're going to go up and fight this. Hey, God's with us. It doesn't matter how, what the odds are stacked against us, maybe. It doesn't matter uh, any of that because if the Lord is with us, hey, who could be against us? Amen. If Christ be for us, who could be against us? And this is, this is the mindset that we need to maintain through our Christian lives. And you may, you know, don't get stuck on the idea of this is only something that happens in major significant situations. Obviously, that's what we're looking at right now, but as we'll see, as we continue to, to, to look on, that it's not just in moments that might be, be seen already as pivotal in your life. Obviously, those are extremely important, but even just on the day-to-day. -day. But let's look at here at chapter 17 real quick. Just look at uh, verse number 26. We're not going to read this whole passage, but I want to point out Right here, the, the spirit of David, it says in verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know, David shows up. You've got the, the, the army, uh, the campment of Israel, and of course Saul is, is leading the charge. He's the king. And you've got Goliath who comes out every day for like a month. He just comes out and he's defying the armies of Israel and saying, hey, let's just settle this battle right now. You just send out your best warrior and I'll fight with him and we don't have to have this big battle and we can settle this thing right now. And everyone in Israel was afraid. They were scared. David shows up to bring some supplies to his brothers that are there and to see how things are going. And he sees what's going on. And he sees this, you know, he's just going like, why is nobody doing anything? Right? Why, why do you have this big bully, this heathen, this uncircumcised Philistine? He doesn't have God with him. He's up defying the armies of God. What are you guys doing? Why is there no one that's going to stand up and fight against the enemy? He's like, well, I'll stand up. I'll do it. I don't have a problem with that. And he's brought before Saul. And Saul's like, well, no, no, you can't do this. You're not a warrior. And he explains, look... I've already faced, you know, uh, my own problems in the past. He, he faced a bear, he faced a lion, and, and he said, the Lord delivered me out of them, and the Lord will deliver me out of the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine as well. And he had that faith to move forward. And that decision, this one pivotal decision, again, has a huge impact on the whole war and on every, you know, the, the enemy flees, and it's just a result of one person. Both of these were the result of essentially one person that had it in their heart. You had a whole group of people that were all gathered together. They had the same cause. But it was one person that stood up to make the difference. And we ought to be living our lives understanding and knowing, look, you can have influence and you can have an impact on people that other people might be a little trepidatious. They might be scared. They might be uncertain. But if you have the faith in God, the, the one action that you do might result in huge outcomes and great victory and great success but you have to be able to step out in faith and that's all it's going to take and the lord can be with you and and bring a great great deliverance we see uh in other aspects too if you want to turn to romans chapter 5 obviously those were two very famous stories with jonathan and david there were two men that purpose in their heart to do something for the Lord, to stand up for righteousness. 
And God used them mightily, even though it was just one person, and the outcome was fantastic. It was, it was awesome how they were able to uh, put to flight the, the, the heathen. But one, just think about this. In Romans 5, it describes how, you know, just by one man, sin entered into the world. So it just took Adam, it just took Adam and Eve, you know, their, their, their sinful actions in the garden to then bring sin into the world and bring the curse and cause much damage by their one simple action of just eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? This just breaking one of God's commandments had extreme, ram I mean, we are dealing with those ramifications today from thousands of years ago, the result of just one person. The Bible says there in Romans 5 verse 18, therefore as by the offense of one, Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And, and thank God, of course, by the, for the righteousness of Jesus Christ, of that one individual that came into this world to right the wrongs and to provide salvation for us. But we see how one person, whether it be Adam or Jesus, right, is able to make such a profound difference. And what we do, that one sin has great repercussions. But then the righteousness of one can, out, can counteract and, and offset, that, offset that greatly. The Bible says, you don't have to turn there, turn if you would to James chapter number 3. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 18, the Bible reads, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. There is a, a massive amount of destruction that can come just from one sinner. And this is why it's important. Look, we need to weigh our actions on a daily basis. As I mentioned with David or with Jonathan, it's kind of, those are major decisions. Those are ones where you're going to feel a lot of stress and anxiety. You might be thinking in your mind, like, man, I want to do the right thing here. But it, it, it's, a, it's a very serious condition. But then think about the decision that Adam made. I'm sure there wasn't like all this stress and pressure like there is in a battle and you're, and you're literally thinking like life or death situations. It's just being enticed to sin. It's just being enticed to eat of this fruit. Like, oh yeah, that actually does look pretty good. It's not nearly the same level of anxiety or stress that you might face and be like, man, this is a pivotal moment and a pivotal decision to make in my life. He probably wasn't thinking that big about it, but the ramifications were the same nonetheless. I mean, they, they were more severe than, the, than the, even the good that came out of David and Jonathan, right? You think about the sin entering into the world it was huge. It's huge. And, and he, he probably wasn't thinking about how pivotal this decision is going to be for like the rest of humankind. But it, but it was. And we need to remember that our actions and our decisions and when we... And when we sin, can cause a lot more damage than you might ever think is going to happen. You might think, well, it's not that big of a deal, or I'm only impacting myself. Would I just do this? This is just me, and I'm just going to, uh, to sin, and, and, and no one else will be affected. Look, every, people are always affected by sin, going all the way back to Adam. As we see, people, other people are always impacted by one person's sin. The Bible says in James chapter 3, where I do turn, look at verse number 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Uh, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. That's, again, referencing just one small body part, just your tongue. It's it, it, in... in comparison to your whole body, it's so little, but it can do so much. And, the, and you know, your tongue can either do a lot of good or a lot of bad. And the Bible specifically here in James 3 is warning about the bad that can happen as a result of your tongue. If your tongue is not tamed, you can't have control over your tongue, you can do so much damage just like 
Uh, you know, we have wildfires out here in Arizona, and they all smart start from something small, like right? whether it be a lightning strike or someone throwing a cigarette butt out the window or whatever. It could just start with just a little, a little flame, a little fire, all of a sudden can get out of control really quickly and cause immense amounts of damage. That's how our tongues can be as well. And that is how bad decisions can be, whether it be with your mouth or any other sinful action can become where you don't have the intent of causing all kinds of massive destruction, but you end up doing so anyways as a result of your actions. Uh, turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 4. And in all these passages, I believe what we're seeing here is <clears throat> this concept of sowing seeds and then reaping the results. So when you sow a seed, the seed is always very small, right? All seeds that you sow into the earth that bring forth these great trees and fruit and everything else that we see that grows from seeds, the seeds are always really small. But look at, look at how much the, the, the magnitude, the order of magnitude of, of what is produced from that seed is, is immense. I mean, I don't even know tens of thousands of times greater. You think of just a little tiny seed and then a huge tree that results from that, I, I mean, who knows what the order of magnitude is in that? I don't know, but it's, it's immense. And we see this is related to the decisions that we make and the actions that we perform is like sowing seeds. Mark chapter 4, if you'd look at verse number 30, the Bible reads, And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Now, this is likening the kingdom of God with that seed. Hey, it starts off really small, right? And you think about your salvation, for example, it starts off with the seed of the Word of God that's sown in your heart. It, ju it's, it, it just takes a little bit. It just takes that Word of God being sown in your heart. And once you receive the Word of God, you put your faith in God's Word. You trust what you've heard. You trust in God's Word. That brings forth that new life. And now all of a sudden you have a new creature that's born inside of you. And that new spirit, that new man... That lasts forever. That's eternal. And you, 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 you go from this mortal creature that's ultimately hellbound to now having eternal life. And, and it starts from something so small. And now the potential to do great is, is, is so significant. And we see here the kingdom of God being compared to this mustard seed, which, hey, it starts off as little as nothing. You know, it's a little tiny thing, as small as seed. But then it's able to uh, be this habitat for other creatures and shooting out these great branches. A fall of air can, can lodge under it and can do, it does so much more. But it has this humble, small beginnings. And like I said, our salvation has to start with a humble start of recognizing that our goodness, that our works, that no matter what good we think we can do, has nothing to do with us being saved. We have to humble ourselves like a little child and receive the free gift of salvation because we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We just need to accept it. And once we have that, hey, praise the Lord. God gives you that free gift. That's yours forever. It's eternal. It's bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read to you from Hosea chapter 8, verse number 7. While yes, we can sow good things and bring forth great things. Because I think we all want to bring forth great things with our life. Don't you want to do good and have great work, works be brought forth to the Lord? And when you can look back on your life and, and, and ultimately stand before the judgment seat of Christ, be able to say, 
Hey, he could say, well, hey, well done, now good and faithful servant. You know, I've given you a few things and, and you brought forth many things and that we could bring forth fruit that is going to be acknowledged by God as being, hey, you really did a lot. You had a great impact in your life for the good and not for the evil, not for the worse, yeah. right? The Bible says in, in Hosea 8, 7, for they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. And when you sow the wind and you, you, know, you sow evil, well, it always comes back greater. Just like that mustard seed starts off real small and it comes back immense, everything that you sow is going to come back bigger than it started and, and much, much, much bigger. And whether that be good or whether that be evil. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verse number 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And I just want to take a point, or just take a pause here real quick and point out, look, when you're saved, you have that Spirit as that new creature, as a new man. Amen. That's great. But you still have the flesh. You still have this sinful flesh. So this is speaking to people who are saved. You're not just automatically always going to be sowing to the, to the Spirit no matter what because you're saved. Hey, if you sow to the flesh, you can because you still have the flesh. You can choose to do bad things, but guess what? God's not mocked. Just because your soul is saved, just because when you breathe your last breath, you will go to be with the Lord, doesn't mean you're not going to reap what you sow in this lifetime and on this earth. You choose to say, okay, well, I'm saved. I'm just going to go off and do whatever I want. I'm just going to live a life of sin. Well, God's not mocked. Hey, praise the Lord. Jesus Christ paid the debt that you owed eternally. But you know what? God's not mocked on this earth. He's going to say, he says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption of the flesh. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And that, that verse 10 kind of wraps it up saying, okay, look, if we know that God's not mocked and we're going to reap whatever we sow, well then let's not sow evil. Let's do good unto all men, especially to them of the household of faith, because when you're sowing that goodness, then you're going to reap that much more good things. Turn, if you would, to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. And since we don't always know when the pivotal moments are taking place in our life, like with David and Jonathan, I think they knew it was a pretty important decision they were making. They might not have fully understood how much it was going to succeed and how great the success would be, but they still had an understanding, hey, this is a pretty important moment. And we have these moments in our life, too, where you have to make a decision and you know, hey, this is a really important decision in my life. Maybe I'm thinking about getting married to someone. Maybe I'm thinking about moving somewhere or taking a certain jail. You know, pivotal moments that you could think of in your life, events that you go, no, I, I know this is going to be very important for me. But then there's others that you don't realize. And this is why it's so important that you just have to keep on sowing good. Right? And, and forsaking the evil because sometimes those decisions that you make, it's, it's just not going, it's not going to seem like it's that important, but it is. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, look at verse number 4. The Bible reads, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. So this is, you know, speaking to when, if you're just always concerned about, well, conditions aren't quite right, so I think I'm just going to hold back. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to do anything. You know, oh, this person, you know, it may not be the right time for them to hear about Jesus. I'm just going to hold off. I'm not going to say anything. Look, you're never going to do it. It's never going to come. You need to just be doing good all the time. You need to just keep sowing. You need to sow liberally. You need to go out and just every opportunity, you just take it and use it and just keep sowing because you don't know. As the Bible says here, let's keep reading. Verse number five says, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. 
So the concept here is just keep sowing. Sow the good word. Go out and preach the word all the time. Don't hope, don't be like, well, I don't really know that much, or I don't, you know, like, look, just preach what you know. Share the good news. Share the gospel. Preach, sow that good seed. And don't say, well, I've got to wait until this or that happens. And then when this happens, maybe when everything falls into place and the stars are all aligned, then I'll open up my mouth and share Jesus. Look, no. People who think that way, they never end up sharing the truth. They never end up sowing the seed. They never end up uh, going out and doing these things. And at the end of the day, the Bible says, look, you don't know what's the best. You don't know how God's going to work. You don't always know what's going on behind the scenes. So your job is just to sow. Hey, you're a sower. Go forth and, and sow the word. Preaching. It's a pretty bad sower if your job is to sow and you're just not sowing ever. You're just like, hmm, well, no, I don't really like that place. <laughs> uh, no, well, let's see. Where's the sun? And oh, Okay, here, right here. Put a little pillow down and a blanket, and I'm just going to sow that one seed right there. And then, and, you know, and then that seed just doesn't do anything. And, and what have you done? Instead of the guy that's going, okay, I'm a sower, oh, great, here. <laughs> Who knows, right? I mean, if you, it, I don't know if, you, if anyone here even sows grass. I know everyone probably has gravel yards and stuff, but <laughs> if you want grass to grow, you can't be sparing with the grass seed, right? You can't just be like, well, I'll throw like 20 seeds down, that's good enough, and then they'll reproduce. And like, no, you got to like cover the ground with that stuff because you don't know which one's going to take and which one's not. And spiritually speaking, we need to go forth and just sow. And, and look, God's going to be at work. And, and at the same, and also, you know, you don't know what's going on in the life of people when you talk to them. So if you think you're going to wait for the best time to set it up in your mind, say, well, no, they need to hear this and this and this first, and then they're going to go, you know. Don't try to be so controlling with that. Just sow the word. Uh, you know, just it's real quick examples. I don't know how many of you have gone and approached someone out soul winning, and in your mind, you're thinking, this person is never going to listen to the gospel at all. And then they end up getting saved. Who, who has a testimony like that? I mean, hands going up all over the place. I mean, it happens to me still to this day. You'd think I'd have learned by now after how many you know, years and years and years and years of soul winning every week. You'd think like I'd get this mindset out of my head of seeing someone and just making an assumption that, yeah, this guy's probably not going to want to hear anything. And I still do. And God still proves me wrong continually. But you just do it, right? You just got to make sure you're doing what's right because you don't know what's going to happen. And you don't know who's going to receive the word of God. So we just go forward and do it and you sow the word. Now, we've seen a lot of different examples from scripture of just people who have done just one event, one decision, you know, the teaching on how, you know, sowing a seed can bring forth great, great results and great fruit. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with just giving a few modern examples, okay? Because I want to try to encourage you to, to continue to do good. And even when you may not see the results right away or think that what you're doing has any impact, oftentimes it has way more impact than you realize. And again, that goes for the good and the evil. Sometimes you have sins in your life, but you have people who watch you, whether it be your children or someone else, your friend, your family, someone else watches what you do and then they could end up doing the same thing. And oftentimes when it comes with parents and children is that your children will take your sins even further than you do. And that's terrible, right? That's a shame. We don't want that to happen. And you might think, oh, no one cares or no, you know, or they know better. I'm just doing this one thing. Look, you, you could have a huge impact on other people for the bad, but also for the good. You might be doing things and doing your best to get the word of God out and, and do what's right and live righteously and think that no one's really being impacted by that, but you just got to keep doing good because you never know. And I look at this church as this great example of the faithfulness of just continuing to sow and to sow and to sow and to sow. I think about the videos that people have watched. Who in here has, can say that they got saved as a result of watching 
a video that was put out online that talked about salvation, maybe eternal security, something like that, that had any type of an impact on your salvation. I mean, that is incredible to me. Like, that's awesome. That's great. That's the result of something small. One video. Right? One video reached somebody, reached many people, where the gospel was explained. The good news, the word of God is explained, and they, and they hear that and, and can receive that. And that's just one seed being put out. Hey, there's a video that's, that's put out. Pastor Anderson, Faith Word Baptist Church, puts out this video, and who knows where it's going to go. Right? And, and we see this happen, but, but in reality, that one video and pe many people getting saved and, and getting reached by that, it's actually not just, like, it, made, it, it is that one video, but in order for that video to get out and to get the reach, there's a lot more that went involved in that too. And it was a consistency of video after video after video after video. I mean, you think about um, the, you know, with videos going viral, for example, in the early days of Faith Ward Baptist Church, when Pastor Anderson was putting up videos online and they just were audio sermons and stuff, I'm sure he wasn't expecting to have such the reach with the message, with the Word of God getting out there as ended up happening, right? But after time after time and just the faithfulness of just continually putting stuff out, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows what's going to go viral? Who knows what is going to draw attention? But just day after day after day, I'm just going to keep sewing, I'm going to keep sewing, I'm going to keep putting up these videos, I'm going to keep on doing this stuff, I'm going to keep on putting things out and just trying different things and continuing to just sew as much as possible wherever you can ends up then resulting in this, this great uh, ability to reach that many more people. It was a gradual thing, an accumulative effort. All it took was one for people to see but getting that out there and exposed was the result of a cumulative effort. It was a result of day after day, week after week, year after year of just work being put in, work being put in, work being put in, a little bit here, a little bit there, sowing, 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 sowing. And hey, look, one of those seeds took off and, and, and now reached a great group. And that's, and that's awesome. And see, people will see the result of one and then try to plan too much. Well, let's create this thing. No, that just came as a result of just trying, you know, just keep working, keep sowing, keep sowing. Don't focus so much on getting the perfect, you know, GMO seed that's just going to be like the instant winner. Just take the seed from the Word of God that you got an endless supply, ultimately, from the Word of God and just, just keep sowing it. And, and don't worry about getting, you know, having to improve on the seed or getting that seed perfect or all the right conditions to be met. Just keep getting that out there day after day after day. And that's where you're going to see the great results. I think of a few examples with people that I know here that have a testimony where, you know, when I was a church member here and just, hey, when, when visitors come in, and I'm sure I know it's still the case here, you talk to people and, and try to give them the gospel and understand, hey, are you saved? You know for sure if you die today, you're going to heaven. And you do that because you want to serve God, because you love people. It's the right thing to do. It's just, you know, you don't, th you might not even think much of it. And I, I could, there's a few people specifically that I know still go to church that when they came, I, you know, became friends with them or, or you know, gave them the gospel and they got saved, which I wasn't thinking much of it. I'm just trying to just, be good and do right. You know, I just, just, you live your life. That's what we try to do. And then you find out later, sometimes you have a, a major influence or impact on people's lives. They come and tell you later, like, oh man, you know, thank you so much for that. You might not, you didn't, I didn't think anything of it at the time. And I don't want to embarrass anyone, but you know, I've had people tell me like, no, look, you don't understand. You know, this was really, really great. And I'm not saying this to, you know, try to lift up myself in any way. My point is just that you, you can be there for people and you can sow that good seed. It's not just the word, you know, like the word of God as far as getting people saved, but also the encouragement and the ministering to people and, and doing good for them and, and, and being able to, to end up having such an impact. If you have an impact for the good where someone might be teetering on like serving the Lord or just completely getting out into the world, think about how huge of an impact that is if you help that person just nudge them over to just 
end up dedicating their life to serving Christ, then all of the good that they do can stem back, at least in some part, to some of the work that you did to help them to get to that point. And, and that is great. And that should be an encouragement for you to just to keep, you know, do good, do right. And even if you feel like, oh, no one know, you know, I, I'm so insignificant. I, you know, you're not. You're not. And you don't have to be. If you are, start serving, start ministering, start sowing, right? If you say, I'm so insignificant, maybe you're not sowing anything at all. Like, like start sowing, right? It's, it's, it's not that hard. Just do it. And even the church itself, I remember a story, I remember Pastor Anderson saying at the very beginning when he started the church, like the very first day, the very first year, he was expecting to see great results, right? Because he said, look, I know I'm doing this right. I know this is how, uh, you know, the, the word of God needs to be preached and, and I'm going to do everything the way that the Bible says and, and you know, in, in areas where people have, have maybe failed or done things that's not the, the scriptural way of doing it. I know this is going to be the right way, and I know God's going to bless this work. And he has blessed the work. But sometimes you don't, you don't, you know, you think, you know, your timing isn't exactly the same. But what we see has happened with this church and with the planting of this church was that it really was like a seed. Because you don't plant a seed, and then all of a sudden, within just like a short period of time, you have this great big you know, oak tree, for example, it takes the time. It needs the nurturing. It needs the time to grow and go through the whole growth phase, which clearly now we can see, hey, God did bless this ministry. God did bless the planting of this church, and it has grown much, much stronger, even though at the time it might have seemed like, well, is this failing? What's happening? You know, after the first year or even the first two years of not having very many people here and not seeing the like what you see today hey just keep the faith you know that if you're doing right just keep sowing just keep going and that's that's what happened here and that's what continues to happen here and that's what's going to allow you to continue to reach more and more people and, and ultimately have great things great many great things being done for the lord because when you keep on gathering now more sowers how much more are you multiplying the goodness that could come as a result and as a result of the ministry. Don't become so focused on trying how you can figure out how to do that one great thing. Like, man, I want to do one great thing for the Lord. Just start sowing and just keep at it. It's not that complicated. You don't have to just, just really invest all of your time trying to figure that out. Just go to the Word of God. Do things the way that Jesus said to do them. He sent forth his disciples two and two. Hey, teach, teach the things that, that were commanded to us. Live righteously. Live holy. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of his word. Don't be a hypocrite. If you believe his word, live, live, live the word. And, and it's... it's I don't want to say it's not difficult. It can be difficult, but it's not complicated. Amen. Serving God isn't complicated. The truth of God isn't complicated. It's easy. It's a pretty, pretty small rule set overall on how we're supposed to live and what we're supposed to do. We just need to just be faithful at doing that, and we can see great things done for the glory of God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the impact that it had on, on my life personally, dear Lord, and as a result, uh, many other people. And, and I pray that you would please just bless this church, bless everyone here today. I pray that you please help us to be mindful of our actions, um, that we would be very uh, take very seriously our day-to-day -day life and just even the little decision-making, Lord, that we, we would be wary of, of consciously choosing to sin because of the ramifications that it could have when we start sowing to the flesh and that we would uh, increasingly strive to just sow to the Spirit and, and Lord, help us in that endeavor. And, and I pray that you please bless this church and the ministry that's happening here and that you continue to work through the lives of everyone here. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.